Well, it's good to be home. Uh, Bethel is home for my wife and I. Uh, I hesitate to tell you how long ago it was that I first came to Bethel. Uh, but it was uh, in April of 1974. So if you are a mathematician, <clears throat> you know that that is 50 years, uh, and uh, I can hardly believe that. Uh, it is a joy to be here, and uh, I am Callie's great uncle. Uh, and if you ask your mom, she will tell you I've always been a great uncle. Um, but. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate so much Pastor Fury giving me the invitation to come tonight. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I want to preach for a few moments uh, a message entitled, So Walk in Him. Uh, I thought it appropriate for those who are graduating tonight, Christopher and Callie, to be challenged to live out their faith as they leave the halls of somewhat higher learning for the halls of even higher learning. In 1974, I was invited to a youth retreat uh, up at Muskoka Bible Center. It was called Muskoka Baptist Conference at that time. And that weekend, for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I heard that Jesus loved me and that he died for me on the cross of Calvary. And the reason I needed a savior was because I was a sinner. I had been born in sin, and because of that sin, I was destined for eternity in hell. But Jesus Christ loved me enough that he left the splendors of heaven as the Son of God and came to this earth he took upon himself the form of a servant, became a man, lived for 33 and a half years, and was ultimately crucified on Calvary, and shed his blood in payment for the penalty of my sin. After I trusted Christ as my Savior, I, a couple of months later, started coming to Bethel. Uh, Bethel was located at 154 Maple Street in town at that time, and uh, I was baptized shortly after, and uh, I had long hair when, when I got saved. I know you'll find that hard to believe, almost as hard to believe as the fact that I was saved 50 years ago, but I had long hair down to my shoulders. And I remember one of the deacons uh, pulled me aside after I was baptized and said, young man, if you want to serve in this church, you better get a haircut. And uh, I went and got a haircut. And... Uh, Shortly after, as I was baptized and joined the church, uh, I joined a discipleship class and started learning about the faith that I had in Jesus Christ, started learning what the Bible said and how I needed to live my life for his glory. And that's exactly what our passage tonight talks about. Colossians chapter 2, let me read the first seven verses for you. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance and under, of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to the Word of God tonight, I pray that you may quieten our hearts. It has been a thrilling evening thus far to recognize these young people that have applied themselves and worked so hard. And Father, we honor tonight the graduates who will be leaving this place 
and going to Bible colleges to learn more of you, to become trained that they may serve you in whatever way you see fit. So Father, I pray tonight that the words that are said would point men and women to Jesus Christ, the lover of their souls, but that they may also encourage these graduates, that they may challenge them to live out their faith, to let Jesus Christ be seen in their lives every single day. And we'll be sure to give you thanks and praise in Jesus' precious name, amen. Paul writes this letter to the church at Colossae. And he is aware as he writes this letter that the church is under attack. That those who are contrary to the faith, those who are against Christianity, have already begun to attack the church. And so he writes them to encourage them, to give them just a little bit of a shot in the arm. And we all need that once in a while, don't we? There's always a time when we need somebody to just give us a little bit of a boot to get us moving or to pump us up or encourage us in some way. And so Paul writes to encourage the church to take heart. But as he writes, he makes some observations that I think are fitting for us. And I want us to focus primarily tonight on verses six and seven. Verse six says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. What does it mean to walk in this sense as Paul writes to the church at Colossus? Well, as we read our Bibles, we read much about walking. Uh, We are to walk in John chapter eight, verse 12, it says we're to walk in the light. In Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6, it says we're to walk in wisdom. In Ephesians 5, 15, it says we're to walk circumspectly or literally to walk carefully. In Romans 6, verse 4, it says we're to walk in newness of life. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we are to walk by faith. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 12, we're to walk honestly. In Galatians chapter five and verse 16, we are to walk in the spirit. And then in Colossians chapter one and verse 10, it says we are to walk worthy of the Lord. As we read verses six and seven, we see the progression uh, from a person who has come to faith in Christ, has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal savior. He says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You know, there is something that has taken place from the inception of the church right through to the modern day. And that is the sad tale of the fact that there are people who take in information from the Bible, but it never translates or affects the way that they walk or they live their lives on a daily basis. And so Paul says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. One commentator has said that that term walk in him means to make him Lord of your life. It is to take what we believe, what has, we have received in our hearts, what we believe to be true with our minds, and let it affect our feet and where we go. And so though I am looking out at you, I am preaching to the graduates. Because as you leave this place and begin your post-secondary education, you are going to need to walk in him. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute, they're going to a Bible college. Why would they need to be challenged to walk in him? Because there are still people at Bible colleges, right? Just like churches, churches are spoiled when people go to them. Did you realize that? I've been told many times and I've told other people, when, if you find a perfect church, please do not join it because you will ruin it. In Bible college, there are people there that don't necessarily walk in the spirit. They do not walk in Christ. 
And so you will need to be encouraged to live out your faith, to be true to Christ, and to do those things which you know he would have you do. Verse seven says that you're to be rooted, built up in him, and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Notice, as we walk in him, growth is taking place. And as I read this verse, I believe that that growth is taking place in two ways. Paul says that we're to be rooted in him. As I am growing in my faith, as I am reading my Bible, as Christ is shaping my life, my roots are going down deeper. I am growing stronger in my faith. But I am also to be built up. I am to be growing and maturing in my walk with Jesus Christ. And I am to be abounding therein with thanksgiving. The depth of roots going down gives a plant strength in the midst of the storm. And I believe for a Christian, as they are rooted in their faith, as they are growing in their faith, that that gives them strength when the storms of life come, when the devil begins to attack, and surely he will. In these verses, Paul encourages the believers in Colossus to remain steadfast in their faith to hold fast to what they have been taught, to have an ongoing commitment to discipleship. Now, Paul uses vivid imagery here, roots growing down into Christ and lives being built up on him to convey the depth and the stability of a faith that is grounded in Jesus Christ. It is not, folks, information about the Bible that makes us to be strong Christians. There are a lot of people that take information in constantly and they know everything that you can possibly know and they can recite book, chapter, and verse to you. But oftentimes, sadly so, their lives do not reflect what they say they believe. So Paul says to these believers, in the midst of the storm, Keep in mind, this is in the midst of attack by the world around them. Paul says, as ye have received the Lord Jesus, so walk ye in him. I want you to notice something that's struck me as I was preparing for this message. And that is, as Paul looks at this, there is no gap between believing and behaving. There is no gap be what, be, between what I know to be true in my mind and in my heart and how I conduct my life Monday through Sunday. For Paul, this was reality. For Paul, this was priority. The Christian life is a practical book and I believe that the Bible is a relevant book and that it is practical and can be applied to where we live today. It has the answers that we need in this present day. We are to take those things though that we learn from the word of God and apply them where we live and how we live. For the graduates tonight, Callie and Christopher, these are exciting days. A lot of things before you, you are done high school. Now, I remember that feeling. Even though it was decades ago, I remember that feeling. I remember the uncertainty of packing my bags and heading off to Bible college. I remember being a long way away from home. I remember lonely nights. I remember discouraging days. And I can tell you with a great deal of certainty tonight, I did not get one of those trophies ever in my entire life. I uh, was given a mercy mark in grade 12 math and uh, graduated high school with a 52 in mathematics. And I know that that was a mercy mark. There are going to be bumps along the way for both of you. There are going to be changes of direction there is going to be uncertainty as you face decisions that you will have to make. But know this, how you live in those moments is what matters. 
What you do with the faith that you profess tonight will matter in the weeks and months and years ahead. Walk is an action word. As I read my Bible, I uh, am struck by those in the Old Testament that were men of action, that did things. I love King Josiah. King Josiah was an, a, a man of verbs. He did things. He didn't just tell people what to do. He rid Israel of all of the idolatry. He followed hard after God. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord so that the Bible says there was no king like him before him or after him that sought after the Lord with all of his heart. Walking implies action. It is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment activity. I want you to get just a few things tonight. Point number one that we are to be continually following Christ. That is the walk. That is walking in Christ. The Greek word here implies the continuation of something already begun. And it refers to the way a person lives out his life. Paul urges these believers to continue following Jesus Christ. After their initial acceptance of Jesus Christ as their personal savior, He challenges them to follow Christ in their day-to-day lives, in their daily commitments. This is ongoing discipleship, and it deepens our relationship with Jesus and reinforces our identity as his followers. In this passage, he speaks of an intimate relationship that exists between Christ and those who follow after him. Those who belong to Christ are likened to his sheep in the scriptures. They recognize his voice and they respond by following after him. Luke chapter 9 verse 23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There is a cost to following Jesus Christ. There are going to be days ahead that are uncomfortable and discouraging, but God is never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Secondly, I want you to see that you're to be rooted in Christ. You can never know enough of your Bible. You can never have enough understanding of Scripture. You are to be rooted in Him. Paul emphasizes the importance of rooting our lives deeply in Christ. Just as roots provide stability and nourishment to a tree, our spiritual roots in Jesus Christ sustain us and enable us to thrive spiritually. So being rooted in Jesus Christ involves deepening our knowledge and understanding of him through prayer, through the study of his word, and through cultivating intimacy with him through the Holy Spirit. Psalm 1-3 gives us a picture, if you will, of that. It says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Number three, Paul says here, and I challenge you to be built on Christ. Paul exhorts these believers to build their lives on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. This foundation is secure and unshakable, providing stability amidst life's challenges and uncertainties. And I'm certain that there's not a person here tonight that would disagree with me when I say that we are living in uncertain times. We are living in unprecedented age when we see up being down and down being up and right being wrong and wrong being celebrated glorified and uplifted. So they are days that we just sometimes get confused over. But the Bible tells us in the last days it will be this way. We're to be built on Christ. 
Matthew 7, 24 and 25 says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house on a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Graduates, build your lives on Christ. Follow after him. Jesus' analogy of building a house on a solid foundation illustrates the importance of applying his teachings to our lives. By obeying his words, we establish a firm spiritual foundation that can withstand the storms that we will encounter. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. So what is the application of all of this? How do you take this and apply it to where you are right now? Facing a summer of enjoyment before the reality of college life sets in. I think that we need to be committed to following Jesus Christ in this moment, in these days, and as you face your college careers. You're to be rooted in Christ, this passage says. You're to be built on Christ. But scripture always leaves us with a decision that needs to be made. On February 8th, 1974, when I heard the gospel message for the first time, I was confronted with a decision that needed to be made. The decision was, what will I do with Jesus Christ? Will I accept him or will I reject him? Now, this message had intrigued me as I heard it that day. Because I grew up in a broken home, I grew up in a home filled with violence, and there was a lot of things that I was searching for, and I just didn't understand the why of where I was at that moment. But the preacher that preached that afternoon talked about rebuilding clocks. For a hobby, he was a watchmaker, and he rebuilt clocks. And he talked about the little intricate wheels that made up the interior, the, the inner workings of a clock. And how that sometimes those wheels needed to be taken out and replaced. And once that was done by the watchmaker, things began to work as they were supposed to. You and I tonight, folks, were born into this world in what the Bible says is sin which is rebellion against God. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. We're told even in the Old Testament that there is none that does good. We are prone and bent towards sin. Now tonight, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. You're born with that nature. But God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And because of that great love that he has for us, as John 3.16 speaks of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Because of that great love that he has for us, he was not willing that Marvin Massacre should go to hell. And so he sent his son to come to this earth and pay my penalty of death so that I may have eternal life. Now, there's a lot of people today that would say, well, if you're a good person, if you do good, if you join a church, if you get baptized, if you give money to the church, if you do good in the community and join a service club, then God's gonna weigh the good against the bad. It's not the way it works. Hebrews tells us it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And the question will not be, what church did you join? It will not be, how many times were you baptized or how much money did you give to the church? The question will be, what did you do with Jesus Christ? Did you accept him or reject him? 
Christian life does not make things perfect. I can tell you that through personal experience. There's been a few potholes along my life's journey. There's been a few speed bumps that have redirected my wife and I. But I can tell you this, God is good. God is good and he has not abandoned us for a moment. And so I encourage you graduates, lean on Christ. In those moments at school when you're lonely, when you're discouraged, when the grades are just struggling to keep up and you've got those assignments that are keeping you up all night long, lean on Christ. But how can you live out your faith today? How can you live out your faith in this moment? Well, I've got a couple of ideas for you and I'll give you this in closing. Pastor Fury told me I had five minutes because the ice cream had already been scooped and it was starting to melt. I'm not worried about it now, the ice cream has melted, so just (laughs) relax. I think especially for our graduates tonight, you can walk in Christ by being a friend to those who need it. Philippians 2.3 says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Be a friend to someone who needs it. Let them see Jesus Christ in your life. Secondly, use your gifts. 1 Peter 4.10 and 11 says, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thirdly, be joyful. Let the joy of the Lord somehow find its way to your face. I was, what what did the kindergarten class sing? One One of the first songs they sang on the video. Do you remember what the songs were that you sang? There was something about joy in there. And you all looked like you'd just been sucking on lemons. Be joyful. Let the joy of the Lord find its way to your face. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart doth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Fourthly, be thankful. Show your gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And lastly, do your best. Do your best. When you go to college, there are going to be temptations to go out with friends, go to the restaurant, and you know you have an assignment due the next day or a test the next day. Do your best. Apply yourself to your studies. Work hard. Colossians 3.23 says, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught and you have been, abounding therein with thanksgiving. It doesn't give the idea of just limping along. Paul says abounding therein with thanksgiving. That gives the idea of leaping and excitement and energy. Praise God for the great gift of love in the person of Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you're not sure if you were to die today that you'd be on your way to heaven, please speak to the pastor or one of the pastors tonight. Please, they will take a Bible and open it and show you from the word of God how you can know for certain that you are on your way to heaven that you are a child of God. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the hard work you've already put in. And keep it up.